Is it? <laughs> All set? Yeah. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get going here. We've got a great uh, program. Dave Dister, our renowned birding guru, is joining us once again, sharing his time with us um, in his generous manner. Hi, Mary. Um, he, we're going to work on Gull ID, something I need to really polish. Um, anybody here, Judy, did you get a Gull ID handout? They're back on the table there. There's some, uh, they brought some handouts um, that are going to be really helpful because I think one of the illustrations is in his presentation. So it'd be nice to go along with him. And Lynn, you've got one. Looks beautiful. Okay. And then we've got some piping plover uh, posters that Judy Bach brought. Those are uh, for the first uh, 10 lucky winners here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have our little business meeting after Dave's presentation. Uh, there's warm cider and donuts. And um, I can't think of anything else to say right now. And we'll talk a little bit more about our business after Dave is done. So let's give a big hand for Dave Dister. Thank you, Joe. Well, some of you may know, it must have been, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I gave this program, maybe six years ago, time flies. Um, so I decided, yeah, that's great. I decided to um, see if I could upgrade my, my PowerPoint program. And in 2016, I finally purchased um, a professional grade camera and um, one to 400 zoom lens, which has really been advantageous for photographing uh, gulls. Um, so, oops. Did I press that accidentally? Okay. So um, I have about 110 slides, but I'll be going through most of them fairly quickly. Um, and certainly if anybody has any questions as I'm going along, uh, feel free to, to ask. Um, this, by the way, this, this gull on this first slide is about the most colorful gull you'll ever see. There are actually four colors, brown, black, gray, white. Most gulls, because they don't have many colors, are challenging to, to a lot of people. Um, one thing folks may not know, um, do I aim this here? the down button. Oh. The oh, the down. Okay. Um, I'm focusing on Mason County simply because I have a lot of data on Mason County for gulls. Um, we have 11 species documented in the county, um, which is pretty good for a small county. Five of them are uh, quite rare. What you would say are casual because they are not seen every year. Um, on the other hand, you might actually call the kitty wake here accidental when you only have one record. Accidental typically means a bird that's seen once in a generation, more or less. So we'll go through all these goals here in the program. Uh, one thing that's of interest, um, gulls have various plumages, of course, but it turns out that you can break down all these 11 species and, and pretty much all the gulls in 
in North America by the number of years it takes to achieve adult plumage. So with our larger gulls, the four-year gulls take four years to achieve full adult plumage. Medium-sized gulls are three-year gulls. And then the smallest gulls, um, two-year gulls typically. The other interesting thing you might wanna know if you ever see a, a couple hundred gulls on a beach, um, most of them here locally, almost any time of year, most of them are gonna be adult gulls. And you'll be able to see that because the tails are pure white. If the bird is uh, a four-year gull, but it's only three years old, there'll probably be a little speckling still on the tail. And I just thought this was interesting. Um, people don't realize, but um, gulls are among the, the longest lived of, of any bird. Um, I've gotten some of these longevities in years from textbooks. Uh, some of them are quite old, like an Audubon Encyclopedia of Birds, which is 30, 40 years old. Uh, I checked the internet too. Sometimes it won't distinguish whether these years are strictly wild birds or do they represent um, captivity. Some of them, I did run across some large gulls like a herring gull that had been in captivity 40 to 45 years. So I think that certainly is accurate that a, a wild bird could live about 30 some years. They're the largest gull that's regularly in the area. So they have very few predators. Um, and the handout I gave, one of the handouts shows a, a what's called a first cycle bird. Um, first cycle means first year of life, basically. And you'll note there are terminology uh, terms here that are used uh, even with songbirds and other, other types of birds. But for gulls, because they lack a lot of color um, and because they're larger, you can see readily more detail with the feathering. And so the other things that are more crucial would be on the wing to separate the tiny feathers that are uh, covering um, the base of the primary feathers. Uh, you go down below the lesser coverts, you get the medium coverts and then the lower greater coverts. Um, these are all protecting the upper portion of the large flight feathers. The scapulars are interesting. Those are feathers that, that cover that gap between where the wing meets the body. So it kind of provides a little protection there, uh, at least weather-wise. And then the, uh, The mantle is basically um, the upper back. Um, tertials sometimes are used as a reference, but that really gets into great detail that most of the time is not needed. Steve? Yeah. Uh, I understand that waterfowl molt. Mm -hmm. Gulls go through the same kind of thing as others? They as far as I know, they never become flightless. So, um, yeah, it's something totally different. I, I think their change of molt is very much more gradual. Okay. Um, so, this young Bonaparte's gull gives a, uh, another viewpoint of some of these terms. Uh, you can see the scapulars there. Um, the mantle is kind of the, uh, the upper back. Uh, the other interesting thing, um, and just as a, a note, uh, 
gulls have 10 primary feathers or 10 flight feathers. They have uh, more than that in their secondary feathers. And the fancy term for tail feathers is rectus. So you may run into that if you're uh, studying gulls. And uh, the rump is that area right above the base of the tail. And lastly, some gulls have what's called a carpal bar, just means that that part of the lesser coverts is probably dark colored. And it, you can see here that contrasts with a greater coverts. Anyway, we'll start off with the Bonaparte skull, which is um, one of our smallest. Uh, by the way, this skull is interesting. We see it only in migration, uh, spring and fall typically, and it breeds up in the taiga of Canada where you have stunted trees. And this gull, I think, is the only gull that nests in trees. But when I say nest in trees, the trees are three feet to four feet high at the most. Um, so here's another view um, of the adult Bonaparte skull. One of the key ID features would be this very bright leading edge to the wings. And in flight on an adult bird, it's very conspicuous. Here we have a, an adult in basic or winter plumage. The head is just spotted instead of being solidly dark. Here we have an unusual bird that we had, um, I think it was the same fall that we had the, uh, the two rarities, the ash-throated flycatcher and the rock wren at the state park. People were visiting the wastewater treatment plant because it was in the area and can be a good place to see birds. Quite a few of us thought, whoops, you know, back here. Quite a few of us thought we had uh, because it has a dark neck band and it turns out that's very rare to see that particular mark on a bone part skull. So the way that we finally determined it wasn't a bone part skull was by looking at the tail pattern. Um, but this is interesting. These gulls at the wastewater plant were picking up on some aquatic invertebrates, uh, which were in the bubbling system of one of the, the, uh, the lagoons, which was a, a better treated area. Okay. Um, you might remember I said, all adult gulls have pure white tails. So in this photo, can you pick out the one gull that doesn't have a pure white tail? Now you'll see a lot of these gulls have a, an edge of black on the wingtips, but it's the tail that's the magic. So you pick it out. Right there. So as a rule, when it comes to gulls, um, most of them tend to be adults, um, which probably reflects the fact that uh, young birds of, of any species have high mortality during their first year of life. And if they survive to adulthood, their chances are they'll live quite a long life. Here's a nice view. It's just gorgeous, uh, very bold patterns.
And I'm giving the date here because uh, that can help with identification sometimes. So here's a, a bird in summer. This is a juvenile bird, just like the others, but here it's got a strange kind of posture. And then here we have that juvenile in the background. Still, this was in August. This bird is um, already, it's an adult, but you can see it doesn't have a solid dark head. So even in August, and I had to check this up, the adults go into winter plumage, some of them very early. So you might assume that this uh, young bird has a parent right next to it, but we can't say absolutely certain that's the case, just as circumstantial evidence. And um, here you can see kind of, this is not, not exactly a carpal bar, maybe a little bit, it's hard to tell. It's at a slight angle. Okay, this is by far the rarest gull species. We only have one record, November 18th, 2013. And it turns out the day before this was seen, an ancient murelet showed up in Oceana County, which was big news because that, that is so rare, there's only a handful of records for the whole state in the last 150 years of bird records. Um, so everybody was down there and I was down there because I'd, I'd been down there the night before because Penny and Ron Bach uh, had found the bird. I was there right at sunset and got a photo, which was okay. But <laughs> the next day on the 18th, a lot of us were there trying to find that ancient merlet. And it was like 40 mile an hour winds. It was, the bird was underwater most of the time. So I just gave up because I'd seen it the night before. So I, I decided to check the harbor on my way back. And this is right in front of the condos at the harbor there. And on the beach from a distance, I thought, well, there's one solitary gull that looks awfully small and it looks strange. And uh, as you can see, what I, when I mentioned that dark neck mark, that's a, a, normally a good indication that it's not a Bonaparte's gull. And when it's in flight, it's even easier to tell because this bird, kind of hard, this was a poor photo with my old camera. It has a dark, thin M-shaped pattern that goes from one wing tip to the other. And that helps separate. Plus it doesn't have the, the bold white leading edge on the wings that the Bonaparte skulls have. So that was a good consolation prize. Yeah. Um, okay. Little gull, and it's another very rare gull, but we have um, more than a few records. Most of them anywhere in the Great Lakes are in adult plumage. Um, interesting thing here, if you see a group of Bonaparte's gulls, in late fall and winter, pay attention because what you want to look for, oops, is the underwing being entirely black. And it stands out like a sore thumb if the wing is totally up. Um, that's the little gull. Yeah. So the little gull has the black. All the others have white or pale underneath the wings. So the wing pattern is completely distinctive. Now, if it's not an adult little gull, it's not quite as black, but since 
percent of all the little gulls in the Great Lakes that are seen, this is, you know, all the states, there are 99% are adults. I'm not sure why that is. I think part of it is the, the fact that they're extremely rare breeders in North America. Most of them are, are coming probably from Greenland and they wander into the Great Lakes on rare occasion. And I think there might be a few isolated breeding records. So if you have very few breeding little gulls in North America, that suggests that um, that's why most of the ones we see are the adults just wandering. Uh, again, you see the wing up there, very black. Now, when the wing is not up, you pretty much have to be pretty close to see the difference here. So you'll note these Bonaparte skulls have a, a dark spot behind the eye, but the top of the head is pretty much white. Notice here, it has a dark crown. That's how you would separate a little gull from the Bonapartes. And it is a little bit smaller, which might be a little hard to tell because these birds aren't all perfectly parallel to each other. And there again is the little gull. And then uh, here's an up, well, actually, I guess it's not updated for my book because we haven't had a little go in the last two years. So unfortunately, um, not sure why that is, but at a glance, you can see the month of November is the month out of 17 total number of birds that we have documented November is the number one month with December being number two. So basically the end of the year is your best shot at finding one. And your best shot is if you find a big flock of Bonaparte skulls. The larger the flock, the better your chance. So if you have 10 Bonaparte skulls uh, on a beach, your chance isn't all that great if you have two or 300 on a beach or in a, a shallow pond or 500. You know, if you're lucky to have that many Bonaparte skulls, then the odds are almost certain you'll have one Bonaparte out of 500. Franklin's gull, um, this bird does not have an entirely black head. You can see the forehead is white. Um, so this would be an adult in non-breeding plumage. Uh, Franklin's gull is smaller than um, uh, ringbill, which this is here, but it's bigger than um, bigger than a Bonaparte's gull. So if you saw Franklin's next to Bonaparte's the size would be different, but, but notice also has very dark wings. Um, Bonaparte's, I mean, um, ringbill and herring gulls have kind of the similar shade of gray. It's kind of a medium light gray, uh, but that can, that can vary by the angle of the sun uh, and the angle of the bird to you. Um, so if you're looking for an unusual gull, you see a, a bird that has two or three shades darker than all the other gulls, then it's likely to be Franklin's or laughing gull because we've had both of those species. Now the Franklin's gull breeds out in the Great Plains. So we have far more records of Franklin's than we do laughing gull, which breeds down the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. So laughing gull, it's a bigger deal because they don't breed anywhere near here. Whereas Franklin's, I think, breeds as close as the Dakotas. We have prairie pothole areas and up into Canada, which is a little closer than Florida, I think. Um, the other thing is 
Franklin's versus lapping gull can be kind of tricky. Uh, the, the white curvy arcs around the eye um, is one good way to, to separate those. And then the wings, uh, this is a recent Franklin's gull that Brian Broski found at uh, Stearns Park Beach. And you note there's a little bit of white between the black and the gray. And that little fringe of white shows a little bit better here. It's even more bold in breeding plumage, but on a laughing gull, it's solid gray black with none of this white that separates those two um, on the primary feathers. By the way, these little white rounded areas are termed uh, mirrors. Um, you'll see that term. So if this was, uh, oh, maybe a second year um, Franklin's gall, it might look like an adult, but it would be lacking these white dots. Okay, and this is just a view from underneath. Now this is a first cycle bird and it doesn't show too easily, but the wing has a little bit of brown in it here. But here you can see those white arcs around the eye are very distinctive. Um, just another view here. Uh, fall seems to be the best time of year to see Franklin's gull. Now this was a really late bird totally blew us away. It was at the wastewater treatment plant, November 19th. Oops, go back here. Um, there was snow flying, <laughs> snow flurries. I didn't expect we'd see a Franklin's go with snow flurries. Um, this is Mark Walk's photo, uh, excellent photo. And uh, so I'm so glad he was there to, to document. This is obviously our late, latest bird ever um, as far as seasonality. So here you can see, we do have a lot of July records too, which is kind of surprising, uh, but an equal number uh, in September. And then of course, one record in October, one in November. And that October record was just a week ago or so at Stearns Park. So we had not had an October record before. And over time, the hope is that we'll have enough records. It's like, gee, why we have nothing in August? So you would think eventually if we get more records. Uh, it just seems like an unnatural gap when we have these two towers here with uh, three records each. Okay, Laughing Gull, this is one that um, Chris Lips found uh, at the uh, state park on the beach. It's a larger bird than Franklin's Gull, but looks very similar. It does have eye arcs as well, but the bill is a little bit longer. And of course, this bird has an entirely dark head. So it's in breeding plumage. Here the wings are up. You'll note there's no hint of a white area in between the black and the gray in the primaries. And here you can see it's heading on its way. Totally white tail, so we know it's an adult. Now this is from Ohio. Um, All Glaze County is uh, kind of in the west central part of Ohio. 
and uh, Franklin's gull is pretty rare in Western Ohio as well. Um, so what we have here is a bird that's uh, just a year shy of becoming an adult in plumage, and it's very gray. Kind of hard to show here. Um, it does have the, oops, does have the eye arcs. Um, uh, ring bell gull, that's our next. Uh, this is one of two gulls that we see year round here on the beach in the farmlands. Um, However, ring bill gulls do not nest in Mason County as opposed to the herring gulls, which do nest. Um, the herring gulls actually nest on the flat roofs of uh, Occidental uh, Chemical, as well as the uh, pump storage reservoir um, administrative buildings by the uh, outlet to the reservoir and the offshore breakwater, which is a major uh, nesting place for cormorants as well, but the herring gulls nest there too. So anyway, the ring bill is the smaller of the two. The adults have a very distinctive dark band near the end of the yellow bill. And it's hard to tell here, but being that this is in May, there's a red orbital ring around the iris. And that only occurs during breeding season. Okay, now here's a bird in September and uh, no sign of red there, but um, you might notice the head is not pure white. So in winter plumage, the adults get a little bit of a dingy spotting on the head and the legs are maybe not quite as bright. Kind of hard to tell. It, it may not be a very bright day, but yeah, the legs will be a little brighter in breeding plumage. It has a close up. Uh, it has a red gape, which is the lining of the mouth right there. And that's that's a permanent part of the inside of the mouth of the, the gulls because it's, um, it's thought that it helps with feeding the young. The young can key in on that bright red mouth, which is a source of food. By the way, ringbill gulls do nest at the Muskegon Wastewater Treatment Plant and probably the islands off Leelanau County. I don't think they breed anywhere closer to us than those two sites. Okay, uh, this is an adult and with dingy heads. So it's, it's a adult in winter plumage. You can see those little white mirrors telling you it's an adult. The white tail says it's adult also. Okay, second cycle. Not quite an adult bird, but very close. No white spotting or mirrors on the black primaries. Pretty easy to tell if it's a, you know, close to you. And the bill um, looks pretty close. The neck is more heavily modeled. So that also says it's not quite an adult. Again, second year bird, no white mirrors and notice the legs are not yellow, they're grayish. We have a first summer bird. Uh, this was taken in June and it has a lot less gray in the wings, the, the wings are uh, a lot paler. 
And then here's a weird bird with worn plumage. So a bird during its first year. And then here we have a first cycle bird, which was probably born in the summer. And by October, just starting to get a little bit of gray on the upper back. This is that really unusual spring bill gull that was uh, uh, giving me fits because I had nothing in, in either of my two gull books that look, came close to this. So apparently we'd say this is an atypical uh, first cycle ring bill gull. You always get some unusual plumages. Um, and here we have a juvenile. This means it was born probably within a month of when it was on the beach. And some neat modeling here, uh, gray and brown kind of scalloping. Another juvenile by October, maybe a little bit different. But of course, depending on where these birds uh, bred, since it's not locally, if they bred at the Muskegon Wastewater Treatment Plant, there may, you know, if they have a couple hundred ringbill gulls nesting, they may not all be synchronized. So you may have some that are several weeks or a month or more in difference in age. There's another in flight. Okay, the herring gull is the, as I said, is the larger of the two that we see year round. But of course, the birds we see in winter, many of them could have come south from further north. And then the birds we see in spring, some of those are coming back if they left. But the other interesting thing is herring gulls are larger. They can tolerate colder winters. So by midwinter, if you look at the harbor and the beach at Stearns Park, there should be a predominance of herring gulls versus ringbill gulls. And that alludes to, I think it's called Allen's rule. So in colder climates, animals have stockier builds. But that's one reason we don't have giraffes in the Arctic, but we have musk ox in addition to dietary aspects, of course. The other thing that's interesting here on the herring gull, you might be able to see here, they have a prominent eyebrow, which helps shade um, in areas where they're exposed to sun all the time. And as you might imagine, herring gulls don't retreat to uh, shade very much compared to songbirds. So being out in the sun, it really helps to have a, a prominent eyebrow. Uh, the adult herring gulls distinguished by entirely yellow bills, white mirrors. This one, hmm, it's not quite adult. Now, although we say it takes four years to get that full adult plumage, it might take four and a half years. So maybe this bird, this bird is certainly an adult for sure. This one might be several months lagging behind or maybe a little bit more, but without seeing the whole wing, we can say it for sure, this bird is older than this. And it looks like an adult bird from this perspective, except for those little spots.
Now in the winter, herring gulls are, are similar to ringbill gulls in the fact their head turns a dingy spotting on it. Um, now, of course, the other major, major thing, ringbill gulls that are adults have yellow feet and legs. With the adults in winter or in summer for herring gull, they have pink legs. And there's a, a red spot on occasion. Sometimes it doesn't show too well on the, on the yellow bill. That can vary. Then you can get a strange bird. They don't show this in field guides. Um, this herring gull has black and red on the bill, which you might mistake for California gull, but the rest of the plumage does not look like a California gull. But that makes identifying gulls all the more tricky, as if it isn't tricky enough. And my favorite golf photo of all time, it took me a year to get this, by the way. Um, I had to get permission from Consumers Energy to take a boat out to the offshore breakwater. And that the boat that went out was from the underwater construction company. So I had to coordinate with Consumers Energy and the underwater construction folks. And I had to time it the right time of year. And I had to go out in the morning when the sun's at my back and the, the water was calm. See all these different factors and I go out there. The first time I went out was late June, early July, 2015. And what happened? Well, nobody told me the four, uh, the, Fish and wildlife people have been out a week before calling all the cormorants. So basically they weren't intentionally hurting the gulls, but the gull families were terrorized no matter what. So they were all the young were hiding. <laughs> I had to wait a whole nother year to do this whole coordination again. So <laughs> finally go out and take a whole bunch of photos, but I know I'm not gonna go back another year. So it's kind of got photos here for sure. And uh, so it was interesting. I got photos of, of young at the nest. Um, I did have a photo of both parents, but it wasn't quite as cool, cool as this. One thing is it has a blue sky in the background. So it adds a little more color to the whole photo. And you can see, these two youngsters are not the same age. So seabirds and even some songbirds, they may uh, start laying an egg, one egg a day for seven days or five days, but they don't incubate until the fifth egg is laid. Or maybe they start incubating for the first egg and the second, lay a second egg, continue incubating to the point where you have a staggered growth rate. And of course, whichever bird is first, if it's a day or two older than the other birds, if it's just a little bit bigger, it'll be able to beg with a little more advantage gusto than the smaller bird. So anyway, um, yeah, they, they look really cute. You don't see these, uh, you know, for ID and field guides because people aren't usually going to be this close to nesting herring gulls. Well, that's pretty neat spotting on the head there. It's pretty neat looking. Okay, if you've seen a chocolate brown gull, during the summer months here, it's an immature juvenile herring gull. And there's no other gull that's gonna look chocolate brown. That only lasts for like a month and they start to fade. But 
literally you can spot a juvenile herring gull hundreds of yards away, just even with binoculars. Okay, this one's a little bit more advanced. Um, you can see getting some white flecking here. Um, this has a post-juvenile scapular molt, which is a fancy way of saying that it's starting to get feathers um, for the uh, later part of the first year plumage. And you start to see there's some differentiation there in the color, the banding. Um, that can help with identification. Second cycle, hard to tell from this angle. We, but the bill um, uh, of this herring gull is uh, way too dark, but, but it's starting to lighten up. So it's kind of in between the adult and the first year bird. And you can also see it's starting to get even more gray feathers. Third cycle. So here it's getting real close, third year bird. And let's see if we look back on the other birds. Okay, this you can see the second year bird does have pink legs. But this bird has a, a lot more color patterning, suggesting it's getting close to an adult. The, the primaries are real black compared to the, the, uh, the back and, and upper wing feathers. Um, it's going to have a black tip there only during the third year. And then by, by the fourth year maturing, that'll be yellow with a, eventually a, a red tip for breeding plumage. Okay, now I just took this a year or so ago and it was interesting. I, I saw these gulls and I thought, wow, we got three different plumages here. This is gonna be good for a program someday. So can you pick out the adult bird? There's only one adult bird in this lineup. Is it number one? We're going left to right. Uh, is it one, two, three, four, five? Number two, yay. Yep, you can see a little bit of white in the mirrors. It's kind of tricky. I think this one is close. It looks like it's a third year bird possibly. Um, and then the other three, seem to be all second year birds. So all we're missing is a first year bird. And you can see they're all the same size. So that, that helps too. Okay, another rare bird, lesser black back gull, uh, very rare breeder in North America. This bird is, has dark wings and back as an adult. and has yellowish legs. It's gonna become kind of mustard color. Uh, as it turns out, this was an overcast day, which doesn't help. Uh, but the other thing is because it's not in breeding plumage, again, the head is a little bit of brown speckling, similar to herring and ring build, but it's a full adult with these white mirrors. Does that stand out like a sore thumb, that dark bird? You see that even with a pair of binoculars, like, all right. Okay. Now the question is, we have two black back gulls that are northern gulls. We have lesser black back and the great black back. By the way, this is kind of strange. We have lesser yellow legs and greater yellow legs. 
why don't we have greater black back? No, it's abbreviated. It's great black back, but lesser black back. It's like, it's inconsistent. Who knows? So size will help determine if you have herring gulls around, which is what we have. These are herring gulls nearby. Lesser black back is gonna be slightly smaller. A great black back would be slightly larger. So that's one way you can immediately determine which is which. Uh, the wing coloring on a lesser black back is going to be dark gray. On a great black back, it is black, black. So it helps to have, obviously, good lighting as well. So it isn't quite as black. You might be able to, oops, you might be able to see the tips of the feathers are a little blacker than the dark gray. And then here we have a third cycle bird. Um, this is a four year gull. So it really looks weird. And this is the great blackbacks and lesser blackbacks that we see tend to be a, a, either adults or first year birds. For some reason, second and third year birds of both of those are a lot scarcer. Okay, here's a second cycle bird. And you can see it only has the dark gray feathers in the very upper back, the wings, um, not as dark. And then here we have a first cycle bird and it has an all dark bill. Um, both immature black back gulls have that. Uh, but again, you're gonna wanna try to compare this size wise with a nearby herring gull, which would be considerably easier to determine. And then histogram here, which is quite interesting. Looks like May is our number one month, but basically spring is far more numerous for sightings than in the fall. So 26 individual birds, the more records you have, the more that tells you the full story. Here's your great black back. I don't think I've ever seen lesser and greater great black back together. They, they're so rare. We do have far more great black back records than lesser black back in general. So this is an adult here. This is a first cycle, so we're kind of going in reverse. The one thing the books will mention, which is probably a good ID feature, obviously this is, it's huge compared to these herring gulls, but the black and white pattern is almost a checkerboard. Unfortunately, the bird is not, you know, perpendicular to my camera, um, but that checkerboard pattern, uh, if you see it well, is a really good clue. I can see it a little bit more, even though we got this darn herring gull in the, in the way. Look at how more massive that bill is. My gosh, we could probably break and op open a huge clamshell if it wanted to. And here's one fine. And another. Okay, second cycle, it's getting a lot more gray in the wings. Third cycle, even more 
more like an adult, but it's got a little bit of lighter brown or something there. And of course the bill is gonna be almost all yellow on an adult. So you can, you can see here that upper back is a dark gray, but it's still a year away from being black for the whole upper back and all the wing. This is getting close. So let me see here if we have the, okay. Yeah, this is May 9th, March 22. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned before, adults have all white tails. Just a little dinginess on the end of the tail there tells you it's not quite an adult. Fourth cycle, adult. And the wings are uh, uniformly black compared to lesser black back. Uh, interesting thing on this fo photo here got a couple of feathers that haven't quite grown in here, but at least they're symmetrical. <laughs> so the growth rate is, is equally stunted on both sides of the, the wings, which is probably kind of a little bit humorous. Okay, remember lesser black back? We had a, a lot of them showing up in midsummer, like, not for a great black back, it's uh, totally different. So it's um, starting, uh, well, it looks like December actually is 14 records, that's number one. Second highest month is January. So if you like winter, winter is a good time to see this go, but, but there's a, quite a few records in spring, seven in March, seven in April. Um, Yeah, uh, eight for the month of November. We only have two months so far with no records. Okay, so we're getting near the end of our bird list here. Glaucus go. Um, Glaucus means whitish, which is a overall good term, but it's only the young birds that are real white which we'll see here. This is an adult here sitting down and uh, it's sitting next to herring gulls. Glaucus is bigger than a herring gull. A little closer view here. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind here is herring gulls, even the adult glaucus, two shades late, lighter. So the other thing is, you know, notice there's no black at all in the tail feathers. Ah, here's a great view, finally. Beautiful pale gray, white fringing, leading edge and trailing edge of the wing. Totally white tail, that's, that's the adult glaucus in flight. Here's a fourth cycle bird that's almost an adult, but the bill is not quite the right color. And, and there's a couple other aspects of the plumage that are not totally uh, an adult. It's kind of a dark photo here. Um, there's second cycle glaucus. You can see it's a lot wider. And in flight, Actually, two of them here. This was a big Sable Point. Like, if you're real lucky, you might see two glaucus in the same area.
And then the first cycle, which is uh, when it's sitting uh, in a close range, you can actually see it's not pure white, but it has little faint brown flecking. And then it has a bicolored pink and black bill. But again, it's a monster compared to these herring gulls. And glaucus gull, uh, again, it's more likely to be found in midwinter. So we have 12 records for December and 12 for January, 51 records. That's great. We got a lot more of those than many of the other rare gulls. Um, so as you can see here, these records only go back to 2008 because nobody was keeping track of these gulls until I moved here in 2008. And fortunately, since I live uh, close to the uh, state park in the harbor, I can spend a lot of time checking the beachfronts. So you know, the other thing is, is pretty cool. Um, we don't have, I mean, this is almost linear here. Um, and of course, if I if I rearrange this by different months, um, it's pretty abrupt here. No October records, and then all of a sudden we have November. So I'd say with, with enough more years in the future, we might have a, a late October record someday. Okay, our last couple birds, real, real rare and tough to see. Iceland gull. Unfortunately, we have two species here, but five, six years ago, we, we had one species. And then 30 years ago, we had two species. So the ornithologists are still bouncing back and forth. Are the Kumlins and the Thayer's gull the same species or separate? One would hope they'd finally be checking the DNA enough to not be screwing around with field guides and making it very confusing. So the Iceland gull, now remember the glaucous gull being very white is bigger than a herring gull. Iceland is smaller. So obviously this helps and uh, this is a herring gull. It does appear slightly smaller. It's kind of a little bit of white. Um, now, okay. Um, here it is in, uh, in flight. Uh, let's go back. Okay, so these, oops. Both of these are first year birds. And um, I haven't seen an adult Iceland gull, but they, they do show up. Um, we have a lot fewer records. So that's part of the reason. Um, but you can see it's kind of a, a mottled white with, with light brown overtones on the wings. Then you have the Thayer subspecies, looks very similar um, on the ground. It's a real foggy day here. Um, however, this bird in flight, this first year Thayer's versus a first year Kumlin's, this is a perfect photo to show the Kumlin's doesn't have the dark trailing edge to the secondaries that the Thayer's gull does. So if you're able to get a great photo, like this happened to be in a very foggy area, I had to send this to a gull expert in Minnesota who used to live in Michigan. And Phil Chu 
knew immediately that it was the first cycle of Thayer's. The other thing is, there have been other people who have seen adult Thayer's, but the question is, were these accurate sightings or not? Because the adult Thayer's has a dark eye, but looks almost the same as a herring gull. So it's real tricky. Um, the, the herring gull has pink legs. The Thayer's gull, adult, has dark pink, like bubblegum color. But you know, who knows how accurate that might be. But for me, I've only seen first year and, and first cycle and second cycle. This was at Lost Lake at the state park. And I, I had no idea I'd be seeing a rare gull there because almost all the rare gulls are showing up right on the Lake Michigan shoreline, either at the state park or the Ludington Harbor. Um, so I knew this was something weird, uh, but I hadn't seen a second cycle of Bayer's gull. And the, the pattern on it is, is outstanding. It's too bad. I mean, I had to crop this a lot. If I cropped it anymore, it'd be fuzzy because it, it was quite a ways away. I was on the island trail. And of course this gull was on the west side of Lost Lake. So it wasn't real close to me. But um, that very wide black tail band is a handy thing. Um, the underwing is what really is unique. Maybe hard to tell. There's a big black spot under the, what you'd call the wrist area under each wing. No other gull has that particular pattern. And here it is uh, on the ice with a herring gull. Okay. Lastly, um, potential species. Because I'm always thinking, well, we used to have 12 species of gulls until they lumped uh, Thayer's gull back with Iceland gull. Like, so the next most likely species odds wise for Mason County would be California gull because there are at least 36 accepted records as of when I just checked the Michigan Bird Records Committee website a day or two ago. And that was accurate up to the year 2020. So, and of course I, I did mention Oceana County has a record of California go. And most of the records in the state are in the southern half of the state, probably because they breed in the Great Plains. And for them to make their way at this latitude, you have to have really strong westerly winds. Um, and typically not in summer, but in fall. And most of our fall winds are southwest or northwest or north, not usually directly west. And of course, for some reason, we always seem to have a whole bunch of east winds. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's our next possible bird. This bird is in between ring-billed and herring gull in size. And not only that, the wings are a little darker and the eye is dark iris. Those are the key features for an adult California gull. And good luck you find immature that it's gonna be even trickier. New gull, only nine records. One was seen at the Muskegon Wastewater Treatment Plant. All the others tend to be in hot spots like Point Mouillet, uh, State Game Area, Berrien County, um, and um, uh, Whitefish Point. Uh, so this gull looks very much like a ring-billed gull with one exception. It's a, 
dark yellow bill with no ring. And it's actually a little smaller than ring bill go. So if you see one of these mixed in with adult ring bill gulls without a ring on it, call me immediately. <laughs> Uh, that would be big news, and that I'd have to write up a four page document, but it'd be worth it. Four records of Hearman's gull, which is amazing. I thought we'd only have one. This is a West Coast bird. It's not really supposed to even wander hardly at all. But this is the darkest, oops, this is the darkest gray of any gull in adult plumage. Um, now this bird I think is in winter plumage, so the head is, is not as dark as it would be in breeding plumage. But this was the first record ever, 1979, and it was in August through December. So you can see uh, it was in winter plumage. And the last one, I know Brian Broski is interested in this. He's looking for an ivory gull. He's like, well, good luck. There's only two records in Michigan. Uh, the rarest, it's not impossible, but you know, hopefully um, if we get more people looking at gulls, if, of course, and now it turns out almost all the ivory gulls that show up in North America are young birds. Um, and they're unmistakable. They're, they're quite small. But notice that these are uh, not exactly rounded spots. Um, so that's kind of unique. Uh, and then it also has kind of bluish base to the bill, which is reminiscent of Ross's goose. If you're familiar with that goose, have, the adults have a bluish tinge around the base of the bill. Not that they're related, but it's just something odd. So this was uh, in Genesee County in uh, March of 2017. So lastly, if you're really into gulls, these are the two books I refer to. Um, the Gulls of North America, Europe, and Asia that came out in 2003 or four. And then the Peterson Reference Guide to Gulls came out 2007, a little more recent. Um, and the, as you can see on the desk, this is not your ordinary Peterson guide. It's, it's a lot bigger, as excellent. Now this older uh, book um, has far fewer photos and has paintings, which can be handy. This has no illustrations at all. They're all photographs. The other thing is, this includes Europe and Asia. This includes South America and Central America. So you can see they're gonna have slightly different assemblages of, of gulls. And if you're looking for something that's weird, boy, if it's not part of North America, Europe, Asia, or South America, it's like, if it's from Japan, what the heck is it doing here? So um, I highly recommend either of these guides and who knows, in a few years, there may be some new ones that come out. Um, so with that, if anybody has any questions, happy to answer, Judy. Why is it seldom that you see dead dolls? Um, well, there are a lot of um, critters during the warm months, you know, that will break down, um, whether it's uh, beetles, fungus beetles, flies, you know, they'll, nature will, will um, cause birds to decay faster than mammals. And one reason, they have hollow bones. So those bones don't persist as long in the environment being hollow. Feathers, oops, um, feathers 
I think probably decay a little faster than fur on mammals, but I'm not an expert on that. One time I read that mice were there, they breed. Sometimes rats get them. Well, that could be. Um, hopefully there are not too many rats at Stearns Park <laughs> or the State Park, but I can tell you there's no shortage of raccoons at night, skunks, and now coyotes. I have a feeling with coyotes, that's one reason we have far fewer rabbits from what people tell me than it used to be. Uh, foxes. Um, so any other questions? Well, if they're breeding in a particular area, you would think they'd probably be coming back if they even leave at all. It would be interesting for somebody to ban some of the birds that breed on the breakwater off the pump storage reservoir to see if these breeding birds stay in the area. Do they migrate just oh, a couple counties away or do they go a lot further? the lettering, but not the small fine stuff. I would have had to capture that turn. And I even put out some feelers because I wouldn't think there are too many people banding Caspian turns, but my gosh, you know, Caspian turns could winter down in Florida or Central America, and they might nest in Michigan, but again, they might nest way up in Canada. So I get really kind of, and I wish I knew where that bird was banded. Yeah. For, for the most part, I think most of them migrate at least to some degree. The ones that don't are, are the, uh, as much are probably the, the ones we have here that look like they're here year round, but I, I'm sure some of them are, some may be here year round, others probably go maybe a short distance. Um, as long as they can get food, um, and basically that means once you get icing up of the beaches um, and the shallow waters start to freeze, that means the gulls have to go out into deeper water and the fish in deeper water, <laughs> could be five or 10 feet or 30 feet down, these herring gulls, well, they can plunge maybe 18 inches down, but that's about as deep as they're gonna get trying to, to get a fish. So my guess is that's one reason we have only the larger gulls. They can survive winter better than the smaller ring builds and uh, ring builds have to, to migrate 